Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Oasis Church Online. Thanks for joining us and let, allowing us into your homes this morning. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us, stand to your feet, get ready to sing out as we sing praises to our King. Come on, lift it up together with us. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is light, lead me in the way everlasting. Don't ever stop, don't ever stop.
find strength to face the day. Come on, sing it out together. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Hosanna, you know, this morning we can lift our voices and sing, um, not because of our situation, of course, as many of us might feel maybe depressed, maybe alone, maybe separated from the world, but we can praise him because he is good, because he is faithful, that he is walking alongside of us, he is giving us hope and a future that we can hold on to him and know that he will never fail us. He is our good, good father. So I just encourage you this morning to join us as we sing. It may feel awkward singing in your home to a computer screen, but let's lift up our voices and praise the King of Kings because he's worthy. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love. together is your good good father to you are to you are to you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am and I've seen many searching for me
You know, this morning, the God of all creation wants you to know that, that he loves you, that he's thinking about you. And you know, I think some of us just need to get that this morning, that God loves us, that he cares for us individually. He knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Thank you, God, for being so good to us when we don't deserve it. Thank you for being so kind and generous. And this morning, we look to you as our Father, as our King, as our Savior. How good and awesome you are. How mighty are your ways. Well, if you didn't have time earlier today to gather some communion, go ahead and do that now. Just if you have a piece of bread or a cracker in your home and some kind of juice, go ahead and gather that because we're going to take communion together here in just a moment. But during this time, I just, uh, you know, I want us just to center our thoughts on Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. You see, that's the reason why we do this. We take this bread and this cup every Sunday to remember what Christ did for us, that he gave his life, he gave, he gave everything for us so that we can have life, so that we can be forgiven of our past and our sin. And I know some of us don't have the greatest of pasts, but this morning you are forgiven. You are a child of God. If you just choose to believe in him, and to set him as number one in your life, as the cornerstone of your life. So we take this bread, we take this cup, saying thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. So in just a minute, uh, we're gonna take those together. Well, let's be led through that this morning. Well, welcome to the Mapes House. Uh, we're uh, wishing that we could be where we can hug and shake hands and at least congregate at church, but uh, we're going through this together. Stay at home, stay safe, uh, keep your distance, and uh, we love all you guys, but we want to welcome you into our home today, and uh, thoughts and prayers are with everybody, and we're going to take communion and uh, be with you guys and uh, heart and spirit, and very, very soon we're going to get uh, be around each other, and Belinda, I got a hug waiting for you, so... Hi, all my little Oasis peeps in my Sunday school class. I miss you guys. I wish I could hug all of you. And we will see you soon. All right. Take one, pass it down. Okay, you guys ready? All right. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, your blessings and, and keeping everybody in this house safe. <clears throat> We'd ask that you be with everybody in our church family and, and all of their families and everybody that uh, is dealing with this, the medical people, the, the necessary people that are working through this and sometimes working harder than ever. And we'd ask that you uh, bless this communion, bless everybody, allow this to be a moment when we can feel together with uh, people that we're not able to be with right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. them down. Love you guys. Be safe. Be careful. Pray, pray, pray. <laughs>
sing and you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give me. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. We still pray in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. We still pray. This morning we lift you up, God. We give you praise and honor and glory. Worthy is the Lord. Come on, sing this out together. Sing in all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Create. Hey, this is a time in our service where we just worship God through giving, through giving of our tithes, giving of our offerings, and uh, that is the first 10% of what gives us. We just give back to Him as He has entrusted everything to us. And I just want to uh, just celebrate today and, and just be thankful for a church who gives. Uh, about a week ago, we established our own COVID-19 relief fund, and you guys gave in, in a big way, and it was so timely because just right after that, we learned of a single mom who was in need of food and, and some financial assistance. She became the first person that we were able to help with the, with the relief fund, and, and how that happened, it's because of your generosity and because God's timing is always perfect. And I'd like just, uh, for those of you who are still asking, how can I give over and above my regular giving, my regular tithes and offerings? And one way was through this 
COVID-19 relief fund. Another way is we established also a building fund. It was our intent to, to go forward with a facelift on our building this year. And uh, so we went ahead, we were going to roll that out, but we just went ahead and established the building fund as well for those of you who are asking how can we give over and above. And if, you, uh, if that excites you to be able to do that, uh, to, to rehab the, the front of our building, you can also give to that. And uh, I just want to also, by the way, bring your attention. Uh, this is really a point of celebration about because of your generosity and God's faithfulness is to, I want to direct you to our faith and finances report. This is a quarterly report that we usually produce on paper. And uh, we're, we've put this recent report up on our website. Uh, you can go to our website to, to the Give tab and then scroll down and find the, 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 the news report on this. And we can celebrate and part of that's celebrating what, we, what God did through you, through his church in 2019, and also what he did uh, in, the, in the first quarter, and what, how, through your faithfulness and, and giving, uh, and that's worth celebrating. I'm so thankful uh, to be a part of a church that, that knows that the church is the hope of the world, and through our giving as an act of worship, that God is able to do so many things kingdom-wise to be able to to help the world, to be able to lift up the name of Jesus. So I'd like to just pray over the offering right now. Father, uh, I just thank you for the faithfulness of your people who understand that all that you entrust to us, you've just asked us to give a portion of that back. And we do that right now as an act of worship. And I just thank you so much for uh, a faithful church, a generous church, that, that knows that, that, that the church is the hope of the world. And, and I just pray that you would bless this offering, that it might be used to be able just to lift up the name of Jesus, that, that the world may be saved through your church. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, we welcome all of you online today for our worship service. Uh, so glad you're here. Those of you on the other side of computer screens, televisions, and devices everywhere, we welcome you today. If you've not already downloaded our church app, do that. You'll have access to today's notes, reading plans, all the, the information about the church at your fingertips on your mobile device. So, so do that. Also, I want to invite you to this week's Wednesday night Bible study online with Zoom. All you have to do to find that is go to your app or go uh, to our website, click the button at Wednesday at 7 p.m. This is our second Zoom meeting. We had a great time last week seeing all of your faces. We're adding something to that this week. While you're doing the Bible study, your kids will have an opportunity to do Bible trivia with a group of kids on Zoom. That link will appear right next to the Bible study link dealing with emotions during these uncertain times. So make sure, love to see you there this week. Also, we're moving next Sunday to a different online platform. It will not change a thing for you. You just You'll have to go uh, and click and, and join the worship service right then and there. But we do have an opportunity for you to, to put a profile, to, to, to engage, write that stuff down. We invite you to do that. So just letting you know of that change for next week. Uh, it should be seamless. This is our third message in this series, Jesus the Great I Am. Jesus, as said, I am. He made seven statements recorded in the Gospel of John. So appropriate for what we're going through right now, just to be reminded of who Jesus is in relationship to us. We saw that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the light. Last week, he, uh, we learned that he is the shepherd. I am the good shepherd, and we are the sheep. Today, we're going to look at perhaps one of the most inspirational I am statements that Jesus made, very appropriate for this dark time in which we're living in right now. I want to go straight to the scripture, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and I want to read this verse. Help me with this, in fact. John 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the what? Somebody at home say it out loud. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will, what, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the light of life. If you follow Jesus, you will never walk in darkness again, and that's a good thing. 
because darkness is scary, is it not? I mean, how many of you, when you were kids, you were like afraid of the dark? I mean, chime in right now, let us know, right, afraid. How many of you, when you were a kid, you were afraid of the dark? You might be sitting there right now as an adult, and you're going, I'm still afraid of the dark. When I was a kid, I didn't care at night if it, if it was dark, because if I had my nightlight, my little one nightlight, that's all I needed, and I wasn't afraid of the dark, right? That, along with if the closet door was completely shut and I had my nightlight. Why did the closet have to be completely shut? Because there was a monster in there. If it was cracked in the night, that monster could come out and get me. But if that thing is shut and I had my nightlight on, there's an invisible force shield keeping that guy in the closet, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Also, if you have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bed, what do you do? You, you want to make sure that when you're sleeping, first of all, you don't have anything like your foot or your hand hanging over the bed because the monster under the bed can grab you and drag you under. And if you had to go take a tinkle in the middle of the night, how do you get to the restroom? You jump over the reach of the monster so he could not drag you in. And when you came back, you jumped over the reach of the monster again to get back in bed and you covered up your head because a little bit of light takes away the darkness. I mean, you put up that little nightlight and all of a sudden the darkness is dispelled. But you look all throughout scripture, there is this contrast between darkness and light. In fact, in the very beginning, God said, let there be light, right? Let there be light. And he separated the, the light from the darkness, the night from the day. And uh, there's the contrast. God is seen throughout scripture as light. And our enemy, the, the devil, Satan, he is referred to as the prince of what? The prince of darkness. So there's this contrast in scripture, darkness and light, darkness and light, God and Satan, God and Satan. In fact, when Jesus came and met Saul, who became Paul, we see this illustrated in Acts chapter 26 when he said, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes and turn them from what? Darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Over and over again, we see this contrast between darkness and light. And when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, when he makes that life-changing statement, he actually said, if you grew up in church, you, you've, under, you've heard this statement, you've understood this statement, but you might not understand the context in which Jesus was stating this statement. This statement actually came after one of the most uh, incredibly grace-filled stories in all the Bible known as the woman caught in adultery. The woman caught in adultery. Uh, right after that story, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So today I want to look more closely at that story, the woman caught in adultery. And we're just going to kind of break it down into three simple parts, the law, the love, and the light. In fact, say that with me at home, the law, the love, and the light, the law, the love, and the light. Kind of sounds like a bad title for a soap opera, but we don't care. We're going to go with it anyway, right? So number one, we're going to look at the law. What does the law reveal? If you're taking notes, if you have your outline right there, the law reveals our guilt. The law reveals our guilt. Watch as this is true in this story. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 2, we're backing up to the beginning of this section of Scripture. It says at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. So I want to pause right here for just a minute and kind of illustrate what's going on right here. There was a Pharisee or two, and, and these religious leaders, they were legalistic they were very pharisaical. That's where we get the word. Uh, they, they found, they went in, they caught a couple in the act. So what did they do? They like kind of rushed in. 
they, they grab the woman, they drag her out. There was this married guy and this woman. We don't hear anything more about the guy. Uh, there's kind of a double standard going on here biblically with that, but they drag this woman out so abruptly that she's probably, we don't even know if, if she's clothed. Maybe she had time to grab a sheet. She's standing there humiliated. This is probably the darkest, most humiliating moment in, in her entire life, shame-filled moment. And uh, they asked Jesus, Jesus, look, should we stone her like the law says? What do you say? So this, this is the context here. And it goes on. It says, in the law. Somebody say, in the law. In the law. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what, what do you say? They were using this question, the Bible tells us, as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They wanted to catch him in a trap. And what they were saying was true. Yes, this woman was guilty. Yes, she was sinful. Yes, she was wrong. And in the law of Moses, if you got caught in adultery, you got stoned. And I'm not talking recreationally speaking. You were stoned to death, stoned to death. And so they were asking, what they were saying was true. Jesus, what should we do about this? Because they were trying to trap him. They were trying to trap him. Because if he were to say, yeah, go ahead and stone her to death, well, that would kind of ruin his reputation as a prophet of love. And if he said, no, just forgive her this time, let her just go on her way, well, this was, would ruin his reputation as well because they'd say, oh, he disregards the law of Moses. He doesn't even uh, adhere to the law. So they're trying to trap him. They're trying to corner him into discrediting him before the people so they can put him in this trap. So Jesus is going to do something very significant in a moment. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to get back to this point that the law reveals our guilt. The law reveals our guilt. Now, interesting, interestingly enough today, we live in a time, I believe, where people don't want to admit to their guilt. I mean, do we not? I mean, this, this, is, one of the, this is a point of contention uh, where people actually have a reaction when I say this, when I say we're not good people. Because when I say, I referred to this last week, I've had people leave the church when I've said, hey, we're sinners. Because when I say this, what do people say? Well, no, I'm a good person. We're good people. I mean, they're good people. And what we've got to understand is we're, we're not. We're seen as sinners in the eyes of God. And the law reveals our guilt. We've got to remember that. So I want to illustrate that to you right now, especially if you're newer. And I want you to know we do this periodically. Uh, I do this periodically just so we can really get to where we really are because the law really does reveal our, our guilt. So I want to go through some of the Ten Commandments, and I just want you to admit, to confess, just to see how much of a sinner you really are. So let's just go through some of those. How many of you have, have ever lied before? Are you standing right there in the privacy of your, of your own living room? Yeah, I've lied before. Just confess that before God. He's like the ultimate lie detector test, right? How many of you have ever stolen something? You, you've taken something that didn't belong to you. Just confess before God right now. I mean, it's, it's not like he doesn't know, right? How many of you, uh, number three, how many of you have ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Yeah, like you're now stay-at-home teachers, parents like you guys, or golfers. I mean, how many of you ever done that? You've taken the Lord's name in vain? How many of you have ever like look, I mean, this is hard to admit, but how many of you ever look lustfully at somebody else? And I know some of you just don't understand the concept of lust because you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not lusting. Oh, check that out. God, you did good with making that creation. Some of you just don't understand the concept of lust. But let's just boil it down. Let's just call it what it is. I mean, if you've ever lied before, what's that make you? A liar. Yeah, if you've ever stolen something before, what's that make you? A thief. If you've ever uh, taken the Lord's name in vain, the Bible talks about that's called blasphemy. You're a blasphemer. If you've ever looked lustfully at somebody, Jesus said it even goes deeper. If you've ever done it, if you actually committed adultery in your heart, you're an adulterer. So what does that make you? A lying, thieving, blaspheming, adulterer? Welcome to the oasis where we want you to get a grasp of your identity today. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel good? We're sinners. We're sinners. 
We're sinners in the eyes of a holy God. Why is this so important? Because of this fact and this fact alone. Until we see ourselves as sinners, we will never see our need for a savior. And the law reveals our guilt. The law said about this woman, she's guilty because the law reveals our guilt. But the good news is it doesn't stop with the law. So the law reveals our guilt, but the love reveals God's grace. And we see this next. They're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trap him. Verse 6, but Jesus, he's kind of ignoring their question, bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. I mean, this is crazy. They're like, Jesus, do we stone her or not? And he ignores them. He doesn't answer their question. He kneels down and he starts to write in the dirt. What's he writing? We don't really know. But there's some indication as to what he might be writing. Some scholars believe, and there's some indication of this, some proof of this, that he was actually starting to write out all of the sins of the accusers that are accusing this woman. So he's writing that down in the ground. And, and why do we believe that? Some, late, some manuscripts actually include that description. A, another reason that we believe this, uh, t- the word to write down, uh, the word, that word is graphen or catagraphen. And graphen means simply to write down. The word here used is catagraphen which means to write an account of, and that's the word here. So since Jesus is God, he's all-knowing, it wouldn't be surprising that that's what he might have been doing. He's just listing the sins of all the accusers, all the men that are standing around, and, he, and he's writing those down, and we read in verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He's saying, if you've, if you've never sinned, well, go ahead and pick it up. And the word used here for without sin has a deeper meaning. It's not just the outward act of, uh, of sinning, but it's the inward heart. It's reflecting on the inward heart. He's actually saying, if you've never sinned and if you've never even thought about sinning, well, then you go ahead and you pick up the stone and, and, and you, you pass judgment on her because Jesus is going after something really, really important right here. He's going after their hearts, these judgmental, arrogant, legalistic, religious people. He, he, they, they had the same problem that so many of us have often had or we have already. They've got this problem of, isn't it easy to look at somebody else's sin and not even see our own sinfulness in the mirror? And, and that's the issue that they were having here. It's so easy to pick apart somebody else. Oh, can you believe she did that? Can you believe he did that? Can you believe they said that? And not even notice our own sinfulness. And we even take it one step further, do we not? That, that we tend to accuse others while excusing ourselves. And, and Jesus was like, if you're, if you're without sin, you, go ahead, cast the first stone. And Jesus gets very serious here. It says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So, so Jesus, he's writing on the ground. And, and as he continues to write, one by one, the older guys start leaving the circle, right? They start leaving. Why do, are the older guys doing this? We're not told, but I can guess. They're older, so they probably send more. Or maybe it's just because they're wiser. And they see what's happening. They're like, I see where this is going, right? I don't like what, what's going on here. Jesus is writing this stuff down. It's getting pretty close to me. I'm going to get out of here before he gets to me. And one by one, they start walking away until Jesus is there with this woman, this sinful woman caught in the act of adultery. And it says that Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? This broken and shamed woman, has no one condemned you? And she said this, one of the darkest moments of her life, but she said this, no one, sir, she said. And there, then Jesus speaks to this woman some of the most grace-filled, lovelace words ever recorded in history. Jesus said then, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Now, there's somebody here today listening to this, Maybe you're in the darkest moment of your life. Maybe 
you're dealing with shame. Maybe you're dealing with guilt. Maybe humiliation. You need to hear that if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Jesus does not condemn you. You are not what you did. You are not what people say you are. You are who God says you are. You are a child of God. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There's an accuser. Satan is called the accuser in Revelation chapter 12, and he's going to start accusing. He's going to start condemning. He's going to hurl those accusations against you. Some of you, you, you know what I'm talking about. And, and I know those accusations as well, too. After what you did, you think God can forgive you? After who you've become, you think that God can use you? After you've done it, you've gone too far. You're never going to be able to restore your marriage. You think your kids are ever going to respect you again? The accusations will come. Those are the accusations of the accuser. That's not the voice of the Savior. What does the Savior say? The Savior says, I am the light of the world. It, when you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. Your accusers are gone. Come, follow me. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So whenever the accuser starts to accuse you of your past, just remind him of his future. You're going down because Satan is going down. Now, was this gal guilty? The answer, everybody, was she guilty? Yes. Did she deserve punishment? Yes. Did she get punishment? No, because of his love, because of his grace, she deserved it, but she didn't get it. And it reminds me of the old story of the judge and the son. The judge in this county, this judge was known for his harsh judgments. And at the same time, he was known for giving mercy as well. So when his son committed an offense and stood before his father, the judge, everybody speculated, would the father deal out a harsh judgment or be merciful on his son? And when the gavel hit and the judge said, guilty is charged, and he charged his son with the, with the highest fine possible, everybody was aghast. They couldn't believe it, that the judge hadn't given his own son mercy. And everybody knew that there was no way the son was going to have enough money to pay that debt, in which that meant a weekend in jail. But at the very end, the judge stood up, took off his robe, went and stood by his son, and he paid the fine, something that the son could not do. The judge paid the fine. So the judge was just and merciful to his son. And that's how great God's love for us we are deserving of the punishment, like this woman. But Jesus paid our sin debt. His love reveal, his, his love just reveals his mercy to us. And he says, just go and sin no more. So never miss this. Are we guilty? We are incredibly guilty of, of sin. But until we see our, our guilt and our sinfulness, we're never going to see our need for a Savior. The law reveals our guilt, but God's love reveals His grace. And, and He looks at this broken woman who's shamed by every human being within miles, and He drives her condemners away, and He says, where are they now? Neither do I condemn you. Then what does He tell her to do? Does He tell her this, okay, now you're forgiven, so just go and try your best not to sin. No, he doesn't say that. Does he tell her, you know, I know how you grew up as a little girl, and I know how you were abused, and, and I know how you've grown up with some, with some difficult issues, and you've been looking for love in all the wrong places, and you're probably going to slip into that behavior again, but just try not to, to mess with married guys. He, he, did, he doesn't say that either. He doesn't say that either. And in the same way, he deals with us similarly in our darkness. What he doesn't say to us, he doesn't say to the guy, hey, you know, I know you're lusting after pornography, and I know you're just a red-blooded male, and you're just going to do those things. And so just, um, 
uh, try not to do that very often. No, he, he doesn't deal with us that way. Or he, he doesn't say to us, you know, I know you have issues with overeating, and I forgive you for abusing the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and I know you're probably just going to keep doing that because it's comfort food, and you do that to get rid of the hurt and the pain that you're experiencing in your life. But try not to eat a whole gallon of, of ice cream before you go to bed. No, he, he doesn't say that. You know, he, he doesn't say, I know you're always going to struggle with gossip. And because I know that, that when, you, when, you, when you gossip, you, you feel better about yourself when you're putting other people down. But just try not to do it so much at work. He, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do it. What he does with this woman, he does the same thing with us. He looks at her in verse 11. He, he had just said to her, neither do I condemn you. And what does he say? Jesus says this. Jesus declared, go now. Go now. And leave your life of sin. Go now. There's a sense of urgency that Jesus is dealing with here. He's like, go now. Go now and leave your life of sin. Right now. You don't have to live in that sin anymore. You don't have to be tied to the darkness anymore. And, and some of you right now, you need to hear that message. Go now. Go now. It might even be similar to this woman caught in adultery. I mean, there might be some of you, you're flirting with adultery or you're in adultery and Jesus is speaking to you right now. Go now. There's this urgency before the shame and the condemnation and the alienation happens. Go now and get yourself out of there. You don't have to live in this darkness because when the light shows up, everything changes. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. There's this sense of urgency. Somebody needs to hear today. You can be free. You can be healed. You can be changed because light always overwhelms the darkness the light always overwhelms the darkness there's this sense of urgency the law reveals our guilt and don't miss that love reveals his grace and the third thing if you're taking notes this this is like the whole message right here and that is the light reveals our hope the light reveals our hope. I mean, watch this. Previously, when, when, I, when I read this, this I am statement, you know, when Jesus said, go now and leave your life of sin, it's kind of like he's, I, I used to hear it as though he's preachy to this person, like he's saying to her, you know, go, go sin, stop sinning. Would you just get out of this life of sin? I, I forgave you, so stop it. But, but he, I don't think he was talking like that. And it's because we get the sense in the next verse that he has this compassion. He's saying you don't have to live in this darkness. You don't have to live with this self-loathing. You don't have to live with this condemnation and this hurt, the, the repercussions of your bad decisions. You can be different. Go now and sin no more. And why do I get that? Because the very next verse says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will what? Never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's it right there. So when Jesus looked at her, and said, neither do I condemn her. At that moment, Jesus was not just the light of the world. Jesus became the light of her world. And somebody needs to get this today. When you follow Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, he's no longer the light of the world. He becomes the light of your world. And that changes everything. Everything hangs in the balance when you believe Jesus is the light of your world. It changes everything because darkness never defeats light. Darkness never defeats light. There's not enough darkness in the world to put out the smallest flame and the tiniest candle. It just cannot do that because darkness never defeats light. And the good news is, when you internalize this, this message becomes personal. He's not the out there God. He's the in here God. And you have the potential because of that to change everything, no matter what darkness you might be walking through. All the condemning voices that you hear from the accuser, from the world, the voice of Satan, you can't, you won't, you never will, that can be dispelled because Jesus, the God of goodness, the God of light, says, I am the light. I am your light. Whoever follows me will never have to walk in darkness again. The law reveals our guilt. We're incredibly guilty. Don't miss that. And until we see ourselves as a sinner, we're never going to see the need for a Savior in our life. But understand that his love, his love reveals God's grace. And we've got to understand this. His light reveals our hope. 
His light reveals our hope. No matter what darkness that you might be walking through during this season, during this time of world darkness, right? Or maybe it's something from the past that you're suffering through, the accuser, the guilt, the shame. Understand this, because he's the light of the world, today he can be the light of your world. And you can walk away from whatever that is because darkness can never overcome light. Light dispels the darkness. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit can do a work in us that we cannot do on our, on our own because we cannot forgive ourselves sometimes. And whatever darkness we might be walking through that's hovering, the accuser, whatever the voices are, Father, I pray that you would lift us up out of that darkness today, that you would become our light, my light. And as you keep praying today, uh, right there in your own homes, wherever you are. Uh, I just want you to understand this. Whatever darkness you might be suffering through right now, whatever shame, whatever guilt, understand this, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those of you who are in Christ Jesus, all that darkness can be dispelled as you cling to him because never will you have to walk in darkness again. That is Jesus' promise. And if you want to be lifted out of that right now, I just want to say a specific prayer for you right now. God, help us to just have your light shine in our darkness. That, may, that we will never walk in darkness again, that we will be set freed from whatever that is. That is our hope in Jesus. And as we're continuing to pray today, for those of you, you've never stepped out of the darkness into the light, and God's calling you to step out of the darkness and into the light, because you need to see yourself as a sinner in the need of a savior. And that's exactly what Jesus is. He is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he lives today. That's why he's trying to shine his light into your life today. And all you have to do is to step from the darkness into the light. If that's you, let me say a special prayer for you today. God, help those to be bold enough to, to put away, to, to silence the accusations of the accuser, to be able to step out of the darkness and into the light today. Father, I just pray that for everyone today, that they would take that step in the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the light and the grace of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you today, please email us at salvation at theoasiscc.com and let us know that you've taken that step. We want to get some more information into your hands. Now let's continue to worship. Die. 
Hey, it's been a joy worshiping with you today. Next Sunday, same time, same location. This Wednesday, I hope to see you at our Wednesday evening study online by way of Zoom. Go use your app, go to our website, set website, click the link and join us for that time. Have a great week, everybody.